Thank you very much. I don't deserve this applause. I'm only uh, as good as the people around me, including yourself. And uh, since we are here in Poland, a lot of what is happening here uh, goes back to the work of Dr. Nitzwicki, who has been fighting this battle with me for the last two decades. And um, I told her many times that one day her name will be ranking in this country at the side of uh, Maria Svetlovska and other scientists for saving uh, millions of lives. So, a lot of things has already, have already been stated tonight about health, about the political context. My role in the next 40 minutes will be to talk about the bigger, the philosophical picture. This meeting takes place at a very crucial point of history. It's about life. It's about life as the very essence of our being. I will not be able to explain all the details of what needs to be said, so I'm encouraging you to fill out the request for the DVD. We will put the presentations of tonight online so you will be able to watch them. So if some of the slides are too fast, you have the possibility to see them again and study them again in detail. Why movement of life? Why are we urging you to start this movement of life in Poland? Why will we urging the people in Romania to start a similar movement in 10 days and in other countries later on? Well, I've divided my presentation into seven chapters and I hope I will be able to answer that question. Why now? Why we? Why you? The first chapter is we need to reflect about the very fundamental forces that brought us here today. Not 10 years ago, not a hundred years ago, but thousands of generations ago. The forces of life created the environment where we live. This is the only planet in the universe where there's an atmosphere for life, as far as we know. The forces of life created life on this planet. The forces of life created human beings, us on this planet. The forces of life created the plants we eat and we need for our bodies functioning. The forces of life created the ingredients of these plants that are necessary for our life and our well-being and our health. Namely, vitamins, minerals and other bioactive bland ingredients, which we call phytobiologicals. Chapter 2. Forces of human dignity. For more than a thousand years, people in Poland didn't exist at that time. People in Europe didn't exist as a continent at that time. We're living in complete illiteracy. In fact, the only difference from the animals on their farms was that they were walking upright on two legs. Because they couldn't read and write, they could not participate in life. They could not contribute. They could not learn. They could not develop 
humanity. And because of this illiteracy, all, all sectors of society were essentially closed off for them with devastating consequences. Epidemics haunted Europe and the rest of the world for that matter again and again. And millions of people died from these epidemics because there was no knowledge of how these epidemics came about. Then this happened. During the 16th century, the printing press was invented. Suddenly, books could be printed in the spoken language. Within one century, the majority of people, of common people, of people like you and me, could learn to read and write, could participate. Did the rulers give this knowledge to them voluntarily? Did they say, great that you do that? Of course not. Knowledge is power. And those up there, they never share power voluntarily. Not then and not today. So what happened was people themselves took the right. They said, we want to become human beings. We want to learn to read and write. We want to live, participate, build. The result was an alphabetization campaign of thus far unprecedented proportions. Across Europe, universities and schools were built in every village, every town. Later on, this wave spread across the Atlantic Ocean and the entire world. And over time, all areas of society benefited from knowledge. Epidemics were no longer the fate of heaven or a curse or a random event. Louis Pasteur discovered that epidemics are caused by tiny little microorganisms. And of course him and his colleagues were responsible that these infectious diseases, many of them at least, became controlled. <coughs> Knowledge was also a driving force for ending dictatorships, medieval autocracy. The people said, we want to determine our future. We are responsible for our lives. We want to participate. The French Revolution came, 1789. Here you see the picture of the Polish Constitution, the first one in 1791. All of that goes back to education. Education became the purpose and the basis of founding schools and creating more education for propelling science, commerce, trade, and of course, culture and politics. In fact, every area of society was advanced by the participation of the common people. So far, the good forces. But with so much knowledge accumulating, it was inevitable that this happened. The forces of evil, as I call them, they started to fight the forces of life. They said, we want to control this. 
want to control knowledge. We own it. We want to determine that. That was the birth hour of the chemical cartel. Why is the chemical cartel so important? Well, maybe you never thought about it, but chemical industry is the industry that determines essentially everything. The colors that you see, the paints of your house, the materials you sit on, the car you drive, the seats in there, the drugs you take, the socks you wear. Go through the next 24 hours, more than 50% of the things you touch come from the chemical industry. No other industry is as pervasive as that in our life. And here is its origin. 1863, Bayer was incorporated. The same year, Hoechst was incorporated. Hoechst today is incorporated in Sanofi, French company. Two years later only, BASF was incorporated. So that was the, the time of, of complete um, of a launch of knowledge in this area about 150 years ago. What did they do? Well, the first thing they did is they copied nature. Here's the picture of a willow tree. You see them along every river. Well, they found that the willow tree contains in its bark a substance that kills pain. So they reproduced that substance, added a little molecule, and had acetylic, salicylic acid, better known as aspirin. And they patented that. Same thing with the coca blend. They isolated the substance that takes away the pain and they got procaine. And they reproduced it. They were able to identify it and reproduce it synthetically. And they did so not just with two substances, but with hundreds, in fact thousands of substances. This is a book from 1897, so about 114 years ago. An annual of the German Chemical Society, where these companies and their researchers published the new molecules from nature that they just discovered that year. And I'm going to hold that into the camera. Maybe you can zoom that in here. But you see here, page after page after page after page after page, new substances. New substances. Just to explain this to you, each line is a new molecule. And in this book alone, there are several thousands of these lines, of these molecules. So this is like a sorcerer's manual, a magician's manual for reproducing nature. That is the complete series from 1863 to 1920 of these manuals. Each of them in total, they contain tens of thousands of new molecules. Knowledge that had never been here before on this planet. They deciphered nature, the molecules. We call it the Lego Principle. The 
that's what they did. Putting little molecules together like in a Lego system. But copying nature was only the first step. What they were really aiming at was to possess nature, to own this knowledge exclusively, and to make money from it. So they were up to becoming the new gods. In fact, they called themselves the Council of Gods. So in 1877, to promote this procession, this robbery of nature, they passed a new German patent law, which defined the violation of any of this knowledge, the unlicensed spread of the sorcerer's handbook as a crime. You would go to prison for doing that. And one of the first battles filed instantly after this law came into place was, of course, from BASF, a patent on chemical dyes. So we need to understand there are three steps in this plan to seize control of this planet by the chemical cartel. The first one was copying and reproducing nature. The second one was to possessing it. And the third one was to expand the new patent laws to other countries. That was the missing link. If they accomplished that, they controlled the world. If they forced Poland, Sweden, Russia to adapt the same patent laws that protected this knowledge, they owned them. And of course, such deviants, such diabolic planes, they have heads, they have their names, their persons behind that. This person, you should remember, his name is Carl Duisburg. He was the chief executive officer of Bayer. In 1904, he wrote a memorandum calling for the merger of all chemical industries in Germany. From 1925 to 1935 he became the chairman of the infamous IG Farben cartel that was already referred to earlier tonight. Chapter 4. The forces of evil's first attempt at world conquest to do exactly what I said to you, to expand the patent laws upon the world and thereby control life in these countries for generations to come. These companies were not operating behind closed doors. They were politically well connected, so well that in parallel to the growth of the industry, its influence on German policy and policy makers increased. So in 1914, they commissioned German Emperor Wilhelm II to go to war. But four years before the war started, they already gave the military they already gave the military the decisive technology to win this war. How? The same chemical industry managed to create bombs from air. 70% of air is nitrogen. They were able to liquefy nitrogen and putting, in, putting it into ammonium, which is the basis of gunpowder. So there was unlimited gunpowder made from air. A dream for everyone 
who wanted to start a war. So not only did they have the goal for global conquest, they also provided the technology to win it. Fritz Haber, BASF. So four years before the cartel launched its first attempt at World Congress in coalition with the German Emperor and the Wehrmacht, they knew how to produce bombs from air. And of course, not surprisingly, Fritz Haber became the coordinator of these efforts within the German War Ministry with a specific task to produce enough ammonium to win this war and to provide other synthetic materials essential to continue the war. We have to state it that clearly, without BASF, there would have been no World War I. But that was not all. Chemical warfare agents are introduced in that war for the first time, weapons of mass destruction. The patent owners of mustard gas and other chemical warfare agents are who? Bayer. They produced the gas needed to win the war when the bombs were not sufficient. The war that aimed at expanding their markets. So World War I, in summary, was the first attempt of the chemical cartel at the military conquest of the world to create one single worldwide market for patented chemical and pharmaceutical products. More than 16 million soldiers and civilians died. More than 20 million were wounded in the first global conquest war of the chemical cartel. This was the price that mankind 100 years ago did not possess, did not have the analysis that we, the speakers tonight, are giving you. And if you don't know, you cannot act. Eight years after that war failed to reach its goals, they did not give up. To the contrary, they formally united into one company. Bayer, BASF and Hertz became one company called IG Farben. Company value 11 billion Reichsmark at that time. More than 80,000 employees doing nothing else than expanding this chapter 5 the second attempt at World Congress. From the early 1930s, IG Farben invests in the Nazis as part of their second strategy of World Congress. This is the headquarters of IG Farben in Frankfurt, Germany. These are documents from the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal more than 80 million Reichsmark paid by Bayer, BASF, and Hoechst to the Nazi parties prior to them coming to power. This is a page from a marketing brochure of Bayer from 1936, three years before the Nazi cartel coalition invaded Poland. This is North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia. You do not need to explain this picture. We've heard about Walter Halstein, 
and his speech in 1939. So six months before they invaded Poland, this guy publicly tells everyone how the future will look, which laws they will impose in Poland, the new laws, economic laws, social laws, administrative laws, patent laws, and as you heard, the blood and honor laws. So it was all planned. One of the central elements of their strategy was the so-called Grand Plan East, in German Generalplan Ost. It was very simple. Germany was the cartel's economic and political headquarters. And Eastern Europe and the rest of the world was a reservoir of dependent consumers and slave laborers. That was the plan. Auschwitz. No coincidence. A concentration camp seven kilometers from the largest Aichi Farben factory at that time. They expanded the concentration camp Auschwitz as a reservoir for the slave labor they needed to build these industrial plants. IG Auschwitz was a 100% subsidiary of IG Farben. We are told the medical experiments conducted on thousands of innocent inmates of the concentration camps were the criminal acts of deviated SS doctors. The Nuremberg war crime tribunal records tell us something completely different. This picture is one of the pictures from that trial. It shows ampules injected into concentration camp inmates. And the preparation says what? Bayer. IG Farben Industries. The preparation didn't have a name. It was a code name because it was what? Patented. So these companies, they used the concentration camps as huge human laboratories to test their patented chemicals. In many cases with deadly results. And who owned the patents of the drugs tested? This one here from December 13, 1934, Bayer. What was the substance tested? It was an azo compound. What is an azo compound? You don't need to be a chemist. Look at those two balls, nitrogen and nitrogen. Remember the Lego principle? <coughs> Cyclone B used to kill millions in the cuts at gas chambers. Who was supplied by the IG Farben subsidiary Degish? After World War II, Degish executive Carl Wuster became head of the new BASF. He didn't end up in prison for what he did. <laughs> he was made captain of one of the flagships of post-war chemical BASF. Again, from the Nuremberg War Crime Tribunal's documents, the dependency of the Nazi Wehrmacht on <coughs> IG Farben's products, 100% of the rubber used by the Wehrmacht came from IG Farben, 100% of the oil used, 100% of the blood serum, and so on and so forth. 
Any questions? We can summarize that chapter of history, especially of Polish history, as follows. World War II was the second attempt of the chemical drug cartel at the military conquest of the world to create a one single planet-wide market. More than 60 million soldiers and civilians from more than 50 countries died in the cartel's second attempt at this Congress. And again, again, the knowledge, the analysis that you hear tonight from us was unfortunately not available at that time. So mankind had to go through this experience. There was a trial, as we heard. 24 executives of IG Farben were tried in Nuremberg for crimes against humanity. We saw Fritz Demir, sentenced for genocide, slavery, plundering, and other war, plundering and other war crimes. <laughs> Imagine the head of Bayer at that time, the largest pharmaceutical company in the world. A company parading as the savior of mankind with new medicines, making billions with that image, and its head sentenced for mass murder. So what happened after 1945? Well, we all know that the political and military henchmen of this coalition were sentenced to death or long-term prison sentences in number. What we don't know is that the economic masterminds of World War II, the executives of IG Farben, were soon reinstated as industry captains <coughs> in post-war Germany. The shares of IG Farben, the main booty of World War II, went under the control of Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Investment Group in the U.S., and the Rothschild group in the UK and France. If we look back, there are things to be learned. One of them, perhaps the most important lesson, comes from the people who were there. Many of them are here tonight. You will hear Jerzy Ulatowski speak to us tonight. They were there. They lived in the middle of this kingdom of evil or hell on earth. Some of them have told me that since that time they have asked themselves, why me? Why did millions of people die in concentration camps and not me? Why am I alive? Chapter 6. The third attempt at global conquest. That part you've heard quite a bit about from Paul. The third attempt is again an effort at world conquest, this time via a new platform in the Brussels EU. In 1956, War criminal Fritz Demer was reinstated as chairman of Bayer. The very same year, the very same year, 11 years after the end of World War II, Nazi lawyer Walter Holstein is appointed chief political architect of the Brothers EU. Holstein was not just an innocent lawyer. He participated in 1938 in the negotiations in Rome. Hitler and Mussolini met in May 1938 in Rome to divide Europe and to make the final tuning for the World War II. One month later, a group of lawyers from, from Italy and from Germany met to define the legal details of this war result. 
who was representing the German Reich? This man. Rome. 1938. Where were the first treaties of the European Union signed? 18 years later in the same city. And even the structure of the Brussels EU headquarters resembles the swastika symbol that Hartstein proudly carried on his vest. If you need to picture the undemocratic nature of Brussels, look at this picture. There are 54,000 paid technocrats, unelected by the people supporting the EU Commission, paid. These are their servants. They do nothing else than serving the interests of the cartel. And here, this little thing down here is the European Parliament with 736 members. They, usually they are there for four years, and then someone else is coming. But these guys are staying. So on every member of the European Parliament, there are 80 cartel lobbyists making sure that these members of the EU Parliament do what they want. The EU Commission is the political executive, the government of Europe. You don't vote for it, as we already heard. There's a wall between democracy in Europe and what really happens. This parliament here is nothing else than a fig leaf. It has no rights to make laws, to initiate them. It's just, it's called a fig leaf. to hide dictatorship. So who today are the political stakeholders of the oil and drug cartel in Europe? These two. And these are the corporations that made them, that brought them into these positions. These are the tools they operate in. Does the Polish president or prime minister influence the decisions taken at the European level? Does the Swedish prime minister have any say in that? The one from Slovenia or Latvia? Of course not. These are the two guys that determine what's happening. And the key assignment of these political stakeholders by the interest groups that made them are in three areas. Health, the promotion of patented pharmaceutical drugs. Energy, the promotion of petrochemicals. And food the promotion of genetically modified and patentable substances. The consequences are unimaginable. Cardiovascular diseases, cancer, other diseases are rising if the knowledge that we carry, that we bring to the world, is being suppressed. Millions of people will pay the cartel take over the Lisbon Treaty with their lives. Millions. You may think this is impossible. Well, think again. These very same interest groups, as we heard, are responsible for the death of more than 100 million people, people in two world wars. Without them, these wars would never have taken place. 
And now they are responsible for 17 million heart attacks that continue every year if this knowledge is not being used in the hospitals and medical practices and 8 million people who die from cancer unnecessarily. They've done it before, ignored the interests of millions of people, sacrificed their lives, and they're doing it again. And as for the Grand Plan East or the Generalplan Ost, well, look what's happening in Greece. Look what's happening in Spain, in Portugal. Look what's happening in other countries that have not made the news yet. It's just the beginning. So here is the master plan, the cartel's strategy to force Greece, Ireland, Spain and the rest of Europe into bankruptcy. Well, why would they do that? Well, first of all, let's look at how they do it. They promote diseases behind the mask of providing health care. They do exactly the opposite from what their goal is. How can you cure cancer with chemotherapy when half of the chemotherapy substances are known to cause new cancer? And if you deceive entire nations with respect to the healthcare system, you are draining them economically. You're killing the people, but you also drain them economically, entire nations. Because you force them to pay billions for imports of patented drugs. And that money, that's what causes the bankruptcy of entire nations. Not because the people in Greece, Ireland, uh, or for that matter other European countries are lazy. It's the systematic drainage of essential funds. So now we come to the real purpose of this plan. The real purpose is the political takeover of entire continents. So by maintaining this crisis, by constantly draining this money, they actually cause the crisis. So when the crisis comes, Mr. Sarkozy can stand up there and can say, we need a transnational government for all Europe. And the same is, not, same is also true for the oil business. So there are alternative energies available right now, but they're not being used. Why? Because they're being blocked in order that this scheme works in this area too, draining the national resources and make the people of Poland and for that matter all of Europe dependent on oil. Same purpose, same effect, bankruptcy of just about any country if that continues. And then in order to hide that scheme the political stakeholders of the cartel, namely Sarkozy and Merkel, embark on what I call psychological warfare against the people of Europe. Deception. They call it exactly the opposite. Defamation of people like us, of the pioneers, who say this is what's happening. And distraction, like wars in Libya and other areas. Purpose of all of that? Confusion. You should not know what's left and right. It's such a crazy world. Let's just hand over all responsibility to those guys up there. That's what they want. Then they launch fear campaigns. Did, do you remember the influenza ep epidemics on the pig flu? There was nothing about it. And the goal of all of that is to cause an increasing dependency of the people of Europe and ultimately to make them accept even a dictatorial regime. 
You are reminded when you look at that at George Orwell's 1948-1984. Those who read it remember the new speak, the new language that is being created in this dictatorship. They say democracy and they mean dictatorship. They say freedom and they mean dependency. They say prosperity and they mean poverty. And they say peace and they make war. And the latest strategy of the cartel is to hide behind social movements, movements of democracy, online and offline. Wikipedia. If you want to know the background of Wikipedia, look at wiki-rath.org where Paul and others researched the background of this medium. But you can easily find out who is behind these initiatives. Because in those initiatives, in those movements, you can criticize everything except the pharmaceutical business with disease and the petrochemical dependency of the energy sector. So that, for me, is one of the compelling reasons why there has to be a movement that does exactly that, addressing those two legs on which the forces of evil depend economically. And if you look for a definition of the movement of life that we invite you to join, that's it. The time has come, historically, for a global movement that defines as its goal to end these dependencies from pharmaceutical drugs and from petrochemical energy supplies. Chapter 7. The opportunity and responsibility of the movement of life now. I was privileged as a scientist to make contributions like that. The possibility for the first time in history to reverse the plaques in the coronary arteries that lead to heart attacks. It's documented in my book Why Animals Don't Get Heart Attacks. I was privileged to contribute in the area of cancer, the possibility for the natural blocking of cancer cells. And yes, I thought everyone will embrace this information because so many lives could be saved. Based on these discoveries, three out of four lives in Warsaw, in Poland, in Europe, in the Western world could be saved. Three out of four. But what has been the reaction of the cartel? Over the last 10 years, they filed more than 100 lawsuits against me, against our research, to block this information. So when I'm standing here and talking so clearly about these interests, that's no coincidence. After 10 years of that, you know your opponents. Their goal is to legally eliminate the scientific pioneers of natural health research and to protect, in order to protect its multi-billion dollar markets with patented drugs. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why is Dr. Ross still standing here? Why are we having this meeting here? After all, our opponents are the largest and most profitable investment business on this planet. So what's the answer to that? 
Well, there's only one answer. We're right. Otherwise, we would not be here. The last 20 years of this battle that I was fighting at the side of Dr. Netzwicki, Paul Taylor, and others, they confirmed the law of historic transitions. They all go through three stages. First, they are being ridiculed. No one takes it seriously. Then they are being heavily fought, in our case, for 10 years. And now everything is breaking down because they can no longer fight it. And everyone says, oh, we knew it all along. So the main goals of the movement of life are health for all, ending the dependency from patented drugs, eradicating diseases, food for all, ending the GMO madness, fighting world hunger, energy for all, ending dependency from oil, and initiating a global acceptance of renewable energy. And this change doesn't come violently. It comes through education, like this tonight. And we all, you, are the teachers. So here are the scientific breakthroughs, the positive things that you heard from Dr. Nitzwicki. Here is the exposure of the background of those forces that try to block it, which you heard from Paul Taylor and myself. So the movement of life, the things we call upon you to launch here in Poland, that's the consequence of that. That closes that circle. And this movement of life is the basis for the liberation of mankind from false dependencies, from the strangulating business with outdated, te outdated technologies. This is the call for a movement of life which has been referred to. You can get copies outside. Uh, it was launched three months ago with the help of August Kowalczyk and Jerzy Ulatowski, both Auschwitz survivors. You can also go online and read this text in the Polish language. That defines the platform for the goals. But what happens in Poland with this movement is up to you. We will not tell you what to do. We have a common goal to give to our children and grandchildren a planet that is different from today. To give, it, give them a future of self-determination, of life, of dignity. That is our common goal. How you do that, what you do, is up to you. You must do it. So you can see that this lecture of mine came round circle. We started off with the chapter, The Forces of Life. We went through in a cycle to the forces of evil and death. And we're coming back now, today, here in this room, to the need, to the necessity to the historical responsibility to protect life. And to the Auschwitz survivors that are among us tonight, in all modesty and humbly, I offer an answer, a possible answer to the question why did you survive to August, to Yershi, to everyone else? You survived, in our opinion, to help launch this movement from here. Thank you for coming. <laughs>